There you go. Okay. Ooh. It's weird on mine because yeah. even I see myself in the huge. <laughs> um, but <laughs> hello, everyone. And thanks for joining for today's workshop on short story beginnings. Um, I'm Delane Just, and some of you might um, have come to one of my previous workshops and already know me, but for those of you who don't, um, you can refer to me with she or they pronouns. I am a current graduate student in the MFA program at the University of Saskatchewan. I am working on my thesis project, which is a short story collection, uh, hence why my focus here is kind of short stories and in this particular one, short story openings. Um, so my presentation today will be a lot of me talking at you. Um, some of my previous uh, workshops will be were a lot more discussion, but this one will be a little bit more presentation and then um, questions kind of at the end, or if you have a prominent question uh, that needs to be looked at right away, you can type it in the chat and I'll, I'll try to keep an eye on those if they come up or I'll get to them at the end as well. Uh, but with that, I guess I will start presenting. And I might look a little back and forth because I have two monitors and I'll be kind of using both of them. Okay. So I just want to start first with a bit of an overview of the, what I've kind of categorized as some main ways I've noticed authors will start their short stories. Um, so these, this is kind of what I came up with, uh, and I'm sure there's more, and this is not comprehensive, but um, when picking through some of my favorite uh, short story writers, this is kind of what I came up with with some of the main trends I noticed. Um, so we've got the hook which I'm sure a lot of writers are already pretty familiar with. Um, the hook kind of starts the story with something a bit shocking, um, something that engages the reader right away. Um, and then the roadmap would be another one I kind of came up with, which is establishing the rules of the setting and narrative right off the bat in those first two sentences. Um, and then in medias res, um, another one that is already, I didn't make that up, that's a common term for starting your story kind of in the middle, which I believe is what in medias res means. Um, so that's starting at right in the middle of the main conflict, main plot, or a main happening like in the action of the scene. Uh, the backstory, um, where this is kind of, I kind of made up as well using the uh, knowledge of already what a backstory you, is usually used for in a narrative, but in this case it would be using that backstory right at the beginning or using background information right in the beginning of the text um, to then ground what happens in the forward momentum of the text. Um, there's also the break from routine. Um, so starting in the moment of change, the moment of chaos, kind of the same as in medias res, but a little bit more thinking of like that um, start when the protagonist day changes. Um, and then the last one I kind of camp with was starting with the metaphor or crucial image for the thematic meaning of the story. 
Um, so that was a lot, and I'm going to break all of that down. So don't worry about this right now, but that's just kind of an overview of where we're going. So, um, I first also just want to mention that things to keep in mind when thinking about the beginning of your story. Um, when you're first writing the story, um, the short story, it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, the start of that story, if it's something, if it's holding you back to think of these story starters and being trying to make it perfect, just write it as it comes to you. Um, write it however it makes sense to you at the, like when you're starting. Um, the, people tend to say like it just matters that you're getting something on the page. Um, and so for some people, thinking too hard about your introduction can ca actually cause you to get a little bit stuck. So some of this advice um, you can also use when going back and looking at the story after the draft is already written and then rethinking how you want to start it once that story is already on the page. But also, if you're someone like me, um, I heard it termed as something like methodical pantser. Uh, so if you've heard the pantser term, it's kind of like writing from the seat of your pants. I'm a slow pantser. I'm very methodical. I usually think of my introduction sentences first. And that's usually where, what creates the story in my mind. Um, and then I orbit the rest of the story and kind of move from one point to the next. So if you're someone like me, maybe some of these introductions that we're looking at and some of these um, styles that different authors use will actually be inspirational to you. And you might get a story idea from making your first sentence. So. Um, there'll also be some exercises from the Michael Cardos book at the end, but we'll get to that later on. So just charging right ahead. So for the purpose of beginnings, I kind of wanted to just start a little bit more general. Um, since short stories are short, you want to pack as much information into the narrative as possible at the beginning to make it make sense for the readers, but also capture the reader's interest at the same time. Um, so some of these key elements that I think are particularly necessary, and most of this, I believe, I also kind of took away from taking Guy Vanderhey's class um, through the university uh, in 2018. So some of this is pulled from him and some of it as well is pulled from the Michael's Cardo's tech, Michael Cardo's text that I mentioned earlier and will mention again later. Um, but your introduction should be your first impression to the reader. It should introduce key elements of setting, character, tone, voice, and point of view. Uh, establish the conflict or the predicament and engage a reader's interest. Easier said than done, uh, but don't get discouraged. Uh, there are a lot of ways that these things can all come together, if not in the first sentence, in the first couple sentences, the first paragraph. Usually by that first second paragraph is when you want to have most of this information nailed down so that your reader knows what to expect from the narrative and where the narrative is likely going to go. Um, and so with that said, 
I wanted to talk about this idea of the author's contract, which I'm sure a lot of authors have kind of talked about before. Um, I particularly took this away from learning from Guy Vanderhey with um, this idea that when a reader is reading your work, they are suspending their disbelief and going on a journey with you, the author. So you will you want to create this kind of contract with the reader, um, build trust with the reader um, so that they will will follow along and suspend or disbelief along with you for the rest of the story. Um, and so by establishing then the inner rules of your narrative, so by usually creating those uh, things mentioned on the previous slides, setting up your tone, your characters, where is this, what's the setting, um, and what's the main conflict, Though that kind of shows like the inner rules as well as the style. So thinking about that point of view and um, the other tone kind of falls in there as well. Um, that all kind of creates this expectation in the reader. Um, and with that being said, uh, you'll often want to avoid tricking the reader unless there's a sufficient buildup or purpose. Um, often people who are newer to short stories might be more familiar with the type of short stories that end in a twist or a reveal. Um, but usually the stories that do that have a inner build up within them that leads to that uh, twist. And so that's what makes that twist impactful. Um, whereas if there isn't that sufficient buildup of gaining the reader's trust, and also if the story doesn't feel like it deserves to end that way, then you'll lose the reader. Um, so all of that, all of that to say that all of your necessary information is always best to be shown up front and then kind of go into the story from there. Okay. And on to then thinking a little bit more specifically about what kinds of openings can we use then? And then at the same time, I'll be showing examples of how these other authors have created these openings. And you'll see, I hope, those elements of showing what the story is about, what the conflict is, and the characters and setting, and all of those building blocks within these introductions. So, if we're starting with the hook, the story I have pulled out is Eden Robinson's Dogs in Winter. So, I'm just going to read through this quote and then kind of talk it through, break it down a little bit. Uh, so this is Dogs in Winter from uh, Eden Robinson's collection, Trap Lines. Aunt Jenna's poodle, Picnic, greeted people by humping their legs. He had an incredible grip. A new postman once dragged Picnic six blocks. Picnic bumped and ground as they went. The postman swore and whacked at the poodle with his mailbag. So this is a pretty good hook, a pretty hilarious hook, honestly. So with the hook, if we're thinking about starting it off in a way that immediately grabs the reader's intention or attention, um, this first line, picnic greeted people by humping their legs. That is pretty 
bizarre. Um, but also it's something that I feel like most people who have been around dogs, you kind of know that some dogs just do that. Uh, but it grabs the reader's attention right away. Um, but what else it's, it's doing here is it introduces Aunt Jenna and Picnic. Um, so while Aunt Jenna is not the main character of the narrative, neither is Picnic, um, what is also happening here is setting up the um, main kind of like motif or main recurring idea within the narrative, which is dogs. And while the main narrative is actually about the um, young girl who's living with Aunt Jenna and her poodle picnic, um, she, uh, I'll back up a little bit, give a bit of context. Uh, her mother uh, was arrested and so she's currently living with her aunt. Um, and like the dogs keep coming up within the uh, narrative, so does her mother reappear into her life. So while this introduction here, we don't actually get the narrative right or the narrator right away, or sorry. Yeah, narrator, I believe this is in first person. So there, it is missing some of those main elements, but what we do get is a really clear jump into the story. Um, so in a way, it's kind of that breaking rules, but also using some of the other rules. Um, and we also start to see this main motif of dogs being um, moved, moving the plot forward. So that's also then giving us the main rules of the narrative. Um, now that we've seen the dog here and shortly below um, is a moment where the police officer comes to the main character's house and asks about her mother. Um, so, and as the mother reappears in the narrative, so do dogs and so do, uh, so does violence associated with dogs. Um, so this starts off a little bit tame, but then there's that building. Um, okay. So then, and the hook you'll see reoccurring in more of the examples as well. Um, and please do let me know if at any point I'm going too fast or um, not fully explaining anything and you want some clarification, you can throw just a message in the chat. So the next one I wanted to look at is the road map. Um, so to me, this is when an author is trying to do uh, essentially what those previous slides said in establishing the rules of the narrative and establishing the style of the narrative as well. So, with the road map, one of the ones that I thought fit this was Carmen Maria Machado's story, Inventory. So, I'll read this one out here. One girl. We lay down next to each other on the musty rug in her basement. Her parents are upstairs. We told them we were watching Jurassic Park. I'm the dad and you're the mom, she said. I pulled up my shirt, she pulled up hers, and we just stared at each other. So this introduction, um, we do get the narrator, we get the eye, narrator. 
And we also um, already are starting to see how this story is going to be built. So what uh, Machado is doing here is establishing the rules of the narrative. Each section following uh, this section, which isn't the entire section, but the, they're all kind of split into a different section with first a number and then the gender of the person that is being numbered. Um, so later it's one boy, one girl, one man, one woman. And at the same time, we also see this part of the narrative starts when she is young and throughout the narrative, she grows older. So by starting with one girl, we're already getting a sense of what is going to come in the rest of the narrative with that style of listing, um, which essentially the narrative does go through an inventory of the narrator's romantic and sexual encounters, um, which then slowly builds into showing a fuller picture of the narrator herself and the setting, which is an impending apocalypse scenario, um, which is quite interesting. Um, but so I hope that kind of shows there how the roadmap doesn't have to be like just stating facts. Um, the roadmap can also be um, creating a sense of how that style is going to play out in the narrative. So for another example, uh, this one is from the Rock Eaters collection by Brenda Pinado um, from the story Thoughts and Prayers. The morning before the school shooting passed like any other, all my neighbors out at dawn performing oblations or oblations to the angels on our roofs. So this one here, I categorized as both a roadmap and a hook kind of introduction. So this story, as you would gather from this first sentence, is about the days leading up to a school shooting and following. But at the same time, we're given information about the setting of this narrative through the second half of the sentence. Um, neighbors out at dawn performing, I can't, don't know if I'm pronouncing this word right, oblations to the angels on our roofs. Um, and in this setting, that is a literal, there, there are literal angels on their roofs, um, not angels in the classic Christian sense, but there are these angelic beings on each neighbor's roof. Um, so to me, what's happening here with the rock eater, or sorry, the thoughts and prayers story is um, that at the same time, in one single sentence, uh, Peinado is both outlining the main um, setting of the text, um, as well as the main conflict, and also the point of view, because um, we see all my neighbors. Um, so through just this one sentence, stating the morning before the event, we already know what that main conflict is going to be. And then we also get from the context of the neighbors um, what this setting is like, what 
that there's this community of neighbors. And so already a lot of information is being shown in just this one sentence. And showing those things can be in just single words. Um, like showing the point of view here is only in that word, my. Um, the time is through the morning. Uh, we get already like the what's happening later. There's so much here that, um, in only one sentence. So she really makes each word matter here. Okay, so then the next one, the next approach is the in medias res approach. This one tends to be the one most people are most familiar with, and I think it's the one most recommended, especially to new writers. Um, and just, it's, it's one that's like in a lot of the advice um, I want to say advice columns, but that is not what I mean. Like advice on writing, it's often people say, start in the middle of the conflict, start in the middle of the action, which I agree with, but also all rules are meant to be broken. And also, um, you can start in the middle of the action in other ways other than just starting right in the middle of the um of the like conflict um but most of these examples i'll be showing you or the two examples both do kind of start um or one of them starts more in the in like right in the conflict and the other one starts Actually, it introduces the conflict, but it doesn't quite start in like the action of the main conflict of the full narrative. Uh, so I'll show you what I mean. So for this one, it's uh, Lisa Moore's Beautiful Flair. Um, it's from the collection Something for Everyone. And I'll just go ahead and read this quote first. Do you feel that? Steve asks. The customer, a leggy junior high school teacher, has just taken up running. Steve rubs small circles on the inside of his own knee. Right there, he says. He doesn't break eye contact. So, this story, um, the main, I guess, frame of the story is that the shoe store co-workers are all competing to win tickets to a Broadway musical. So where the story begins is right in the scene of Steve trying to make a sale to this uh, leggy junior high school teacher. Um, so right from the beginning, we're thrown right into the action of what's currently happening for the frame of the narrative. But the story ends up being more so about is why Steve wants to win the tickets and also the kind of love triangle that has formed before the main uh, present of the narrative between the coworkers at the shoe store. So this uh, opening establishes one of our main characters, Steve, and it also establishes the setting. Um, Maybe it's not quite clear yet from here, but we start to get an, uh, an idea that, okay, he's kind of showing her 
this like spot on her leg that's he's like that's where, where you have to work on if you like just starting running um, just after this we get more information about it being in the shoe store um, so he's so Lisa Moore is creating those necessary um, aspects of information right from the get-go but what doesn't happen until later on is the build-up and the exploration of that uh, love triangle um, and that Steve is trying to win these tickets to take his manager, Kathy, to that musical that he honestly doesn't want to go to. Uh, but this, by starting it this way, we're thrown right into this situation and it is a competition. So we get kind of thrown right into the action, right into the conflict, or at least the outer conflict. And then the story starts to dig into that inner conflict, if that's making sense. So that this one, I think, follows a more traditional style of starting in medias res. We're starting right in the action, but we're not starting directly at the like main scene of like the climax of the story or the main um, kind of conflict of the story quite yet. And then if we look at this one called Midnight Liquor Shadow by Becky Hagenston. Um, and I'll just read this one out. So midnight, licorice, shadow, she says, Coco, Casper, Dr. Livingston, Alfred Hitchcock, he says, Drac Dracula, Vincent Price, they have had the cat for nearly three days. So this one starts off with really not a ton of contextual information. And this one actually does go a little bit against that classic um, kind of idea of having like the setting and everything established right from the get-go. So this one actually breaks some of the rules that I've already been talking about. But what this introduction does do is drop us in the point of the main conflict, but we don't know it yet. Um, so we start with dialogue as both of these examples did, and that's a common way to start in medias res. Um, we don't yet know who she is, nor he, um, but we do then get we have it explained to us that it's that this is the cat. So we now understand the cat. A cat is being named. So this introduction also mirrors a similar conversation right at the very end of the narrative. So. This style of media's res drops us in that moment of trying to name this cat, and then it also ends with that moment of naming the cat or trying to name the cat um, and creates this kind of frame and this mirroring on either side. And while when we first read this, and actually when I first read it the first time, I was like, so thrown off guard i was like these are like um if you've ever heard people say it's talking heads where you don't fully see the scene yet you don't know who's talking and that's usually frowned upon a lot of the time but on subsequent readings and as i got further into the story it really couldn't have started any other way nor ended any other way um, and that is because we learn the importance of naming to this narrative. 
um, which actually ends up being all about naming and all about identity and whether or not this cat is named may have fatal consequences for not only the cat but the main character uh the she in the quotation so so for this story while it breaks a lot of rules it still does follow that in media's res idea of dropping you right into the scene and then explaining the purpose the middle of the text then it explains the purpose of this naming and this the reason naming is so important in the narrative and then it comes back to this scene again and then you understand the weight of this moment um, and sorry if I'm talking too much about full stories, but the introductions really do create usually they're like your first part of the story and they usually are so important to what comes after. So I just want to also show what happens later in narrative so that we can kind of come back and see, okay, then why might this have been the right? introduction okay and the next one that i thought of was going with a bit of backstory right at the beginning of the narrative so this one I think can be kind of similar to giving the roadmap, um, but less of a focus maybe on the style and identifying the core style of the piece and more so about giving um, actual backstory for the main character right at the beginning so that the subsequent um, sections make a little bit more sense or kind of creates this um feeling of understanding while still having momentum um and backstories i would also say could be done wrong quite easily if they end up being too bogged down in the past rather than the present of the narrative, depending on what the story is going for. Um, so hopefully these two examples kind of show um, what a successful way to introduce like the backstory of the character into the narrative without bogging it down too much and with still getting that forward momentum um and breaking into that main conflict right from the start and i think that's the key that the backstory needs to be ex re extremely relevant to the main conflict in the short story um for it to be like have a reason to be there and to really like make itself worth being there um so for the first one it's a bit of a shorter little chunk of backstory um so this is from sydney warner Bruman's danny boy from the pump and i'll read it out the only buy the blue popsicles from mr arbor at eggs and things after somebody dies they cost 5.99 each there's a lump of red dye in the middle, and after you finish the whole thing, you stick the stick to the side of someone's plastic recycling bin. So this introduction gives the reader a lot of contextual information um, and gives a little bit of the backstory about the character who, since we're using second person here, which is also 
establish right in that first word. Um, the, the character that you is referring to is Milo, so I'll refer to him as Milo. Um, but Milo, we get, we get, we understand right from the beginning, this first sentence that he buys popsicles in an almost ritualistic way, um, to show his mourning or grief after someone dies. So while we get a little line or two or three of backstory here about okay like this is something milo would do um this is past this is something that like he like would do i guess it, we're actually using even kind of like a future um oh i can't remember what it's called but using the word would implies that it would happen again in the future um but we're just getting a bit of backstory about the character here um and so what else we get though is a lot of information about the main conflict of the story as well as milo's character and more insight into that um, so the story tells us in the second person the main character has a ritual of eating popsicles when someone dies someone has died before and someone likely dies just before the start of the narration. So by saying you would only buy when this happens, insinuates that the death in the current narrative is not the only death that has happened near this person and in their community. Um, we also though get extra character information with the buying the popsicles when someone dies, and also the sticking the popsicle to the side of someone's recycling bin. This like rude gesture um, that is done for no other reason than to just like be rude, um, which we can insinuate might make the main character feel like maybe that helps them feel better, but um, we're already getting the sense of who this character is, um, as well as the conflict about someone has died in this narrative, and likely this narrative is going to revolve around that. Um, and it's also an engaging hook to, like, especially at the end of that first sentence, you buy it after somebody dies. And we already have that hook, which then propels through this bit of backstory. So, another one, a bit of a longer one, is from Ian Williams' Statistics, um, which is from the collection Not Anyone's Anything. And I'll read this one out too. 60% of black children grow up without a father. I find every other thing to think about except that. It's an American statistic anyway, and I'm not. People can't be statistics. Statistics are for a man with an overbite, a steno pad, and pants that could be let down at the hem an inch. Don't think about them. Don't think about my father, who is definitely not a statistic, and what will be a long, shifty-eyed shifty -eyed conversation in an Indian restaurant about the 17-plus years since we last saw each other because there are other things to think about, such as not looking like a mama's boy, which is how he must remember me, small boned, sickly, like my pants could be let down at the hem an inch. So I really love this introduction um, for a lot of reasons, um, but primarily because it's doing so much in a lot of words, but it also just creates this momentum that keeps going and then keeps going throughout the narrative. 
um, already that roadmap ideas followed of giving that voice and style of the text right from the beginning. Um, the point of view is established with I find every other thing to think about. But at the same time, there is all of this backstory packed up in here. Um, there is, uh, first of all, there's the mention of 60% of Black children grow up without a father, which is more of a research element placed in. But it does give the background of the text that, okay, this is what this story is kind of going to be about. Um, we also get the backstory of the relationship between the main character and his father um, and how long they've been apart. We get all of this information before the story does dive into this meeting and confrontation between the two. So I would say that this is one of the a really effective way to give all of that information, but using that character's voice and creating those that like rhythm of language really keeps propelling it forward and keeps the reader still interested even though this is all information that's more in the narrator's mind and it's more them explaining a little bit of their past before we really get into the current of the narrative. Uh, also shows the conflict with the father already in this chunk here. Okay, one more, oh, two more. I will try to get through them so that we have a bit of time left at the end for questions. So the break from routine one, similar to the in media's res um, style, but um, this one I think focuses more on what is that change? What is that thing that makes this day different from other days? Um, and that's also something you might often hear for writing advice is start your story when the main character's routine changes. Uh, so this one, I think one of the main things to think about is um, also in a way showing why it's a change from routine um, and keeping that interest. Um, you don't want to, um, kind of like with in media service as well, you don't want to drop in without too much information. Like you want there to be enough information that the reader when they drop into this moment, knows kind of can get themselves oriented. Um, but at the same time, you do want to start it with that, that, like, okay, like something's different. Now what's happening in the narrative? What is the conflict? And that's kind of what gets the ball rolling. Um, so for this one, I have uh, the first line from the Brooks Brothers Guru by Alex Olin. Um, so I'll read this one. John Lorimer wants to be friends on Facebook. Amanda isn't sure whether to accept. It's a long night like any other, her bedroom blue lit by devices, laptop and phone and iPad scattered on the comforter, earbuds nestled as she listens to folk and singer songwriters on Spotify. This is how she goes to sleep. So for this story, what I find particularly interesting about this in introduction is the way it starts with that sentence of this is the break from routine with John Lorimer wants to be friends on Facebook. That is the inciting incident of the narrator and what leads to Amanda traveling to see 
um, John Larimer, which is her cousin, I believe first cousin, um, who is involved in almost a cult-like communal living situation focused around one primary like philosophical guru character. Um, and so we start with that inciting incident. John Lerner wants to be friends on Facebook. And then we're given a little bit of Amanda. What is Amanda like? Um, and what is Amanda's relationship with Lorimer like? Um, so we see she's not sure whether she wants to accept. Um, and then we get the kind of more thorough information about her setting, what kind of person she is. She's likely probably around millennial age with like all the devices kind of scattered around listening to Spotify. Um, so we get a sense of Amanda as a character. And so um, there's the break from routine, but also the establishment of character at the same time. Um, so in that way, it kind of both shows what the routine was as well as uh, what changed it or what will be the inciting incident to change it, which is her adding John Lorimer on Facebook and then realizing what he kind of got himself caught up in. Okay. And last one is the metaphor. And this one I kind of mentioned as well in the Eden Robinson story of that recurring metaphor of the dog. Um, so what we'll see with this one is a similar um, style used in the next example. Essentially with the metaphor, um, do you want to locate what that major metaphor or major symbolic idea is within the text and use that symbol as a way to draw the story together and then keep it going and return back to that image to then reestablish the theme. So for this technique, it would be more so what I might recommend either if you if you do start it already knowing what the metaphor is, then that would be one way. But it could also be something that could be fleshed out in um, revisions once the draft is made. If there seems to have been a primary metaphor that did come out in the draft, then this might be what could be used to then create the introduction and to um, like rewrite an introduction to fit kind of the full metaphor of the story. So for this one, I have Madeline Theon's Simple Recipes, um, which is from the collection also titled Simple Recipes. And I will read this one out. There is a simple recipe for making rice. My father taught it to me when I was a child. Back then, I used to sit up on the kitchen counter watching him how he sifted the grains in his hands, sure and quick, removing pieces of dirt or sand and tiny, or sorry, pieces of dirt or sand, tiny imperfections. So this narrative, as you might also see from the title, Simple Recipes, um, comes back to food and particularly families and cooking, as well as mealtimes and kind of sharing food as a family. The story's conflict is not introduced yet. The story's conflict comes through once we start to see the family 
coming together in scene. But here, what we're getting is the first mention of the rice and of cooking rice, setting up the story, but also setting up the symbol of cooking, particularly the recipe of cooking rice. And what it symbolizes in this text is both the connection between the daughter and father, as they're often the two who cook together, uh, but also the connections between all of the family members, especially during mealtime, and um, how the father, like he does with the rice, um, sifting it um, with like this ease and this perfection, removing dirt and sand and imperfections, he also does this same kind of thing to his family as well. Um, his, the brother of the main character particularly is um, the one who gets the full brunt of this, um, where he uh, chastises and also um, like physically hits like the brother. So that's when the narrative kind of starts to heat up quite a bit. Um, and so while we start with the simple recipe, that metaphor is created here in more of a um, softer sense, but then later we see the metaphor becoming like darker and we see that what it fully represents later in the narrative. Okay, there's a lot of talking. Um, but for just back again to that overview, I have it on screen again here. Um, these six that I kind of came up with when I was looking through some of my favorites were, which were the ones I featured in the presentation. Um, and are there any questions about that or I can leave that for a moment. I'll also, before the recording stops, there's also um, some exercises that I'd want to leave you with to take away and do afterwards. Um, this will be recorded so you'll be able to see these again and pause it to look at them. Um, or I can also send around a copy of the PowerPoint as well. Um, but I hope that that was helpful in kind of breaking down introductions. There's no right way. It's kind of just whatever the right thing for that story is. But yeah, thank you very much.